There we go. And welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of Truth to Power here on your community radio station. We are Louisville's Forward Radio, WFMP, broadcasting from the top of the Hayburn Building here at 106.5 FM and live streaming to the world at forwardradio.org. My name is Justin Mog. I'm a programmer here on the station. Uh, I, I do a show called Sustainability Now, which I hope you'll tune into. But I also am joined in the virtual studio by this week's co-host, Hart Hagen, who is uh, just on his first week of hosting a new hour-long program called Let's Talk. How's it been going, Hart? It's going great, thanks. Good, good. We have some birds in the virtual studio with us today, too, because we are going to talk about uh, native plants and all of the creatures who benefit from their uh, application on the landscape, their their existence on the landscape, and how we as citizens of planet Earth can help uh, live in greater harmony with these other creatures uh, through the fostering of native plants and trees. Uh, so maybe, you know, you got the uh, spring fever, right? You've been cooped up in your house during COVID-19 and thinking about what you can do. Maybe you've been out in the yard more than ever. Well, this is a great time to think about how you can incorporate native plants into your landscape. So that's what we're going to be talking about today uh, with a bunch of great guests. We've got uh, a couple owners of important organizations, some of which I never knew about before. So first, let me introduce Elizabeth Kuhn. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thanks for having me. She is owner of Backyard Botanicals. You can find them online at backyardbotanicalsky.com. Elizabeth, do you want to say really quick, uh, tell us about Backyard Botanicals? Sure, it's um, native landscaping. We do design, installation, and maintenance of native plants. That simple. Are you based here in Louisville, or are you work yeah. statewide? Based in Louisville. Awesome. We also have Alicia Fuel, owner of Grow Wilder Native Plant Nursery. Hey, Alicia. Hi, how are you? Great, great. She's she's joining us in, from her backyard. That's where you hear all those lovely birds. And her uh, husband, Josh Fuel, is here, too. Hey, Josh. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Good to have you all here. Uh, so uh, you can find them on Facebook at Grow Wilder KY. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the plant nursery, where it is, what, what, what you all do? Sure. Yeah, um, we are located in Bullock County, uh, northern Bullock County, between Hillview and Shepherdsville. Uh, right. We operate it out of our house. Um, we do no contact porch pickups as of right now and um, some deliveries. Um, I will come out and also try to um, help you design your garden, give you a little jump start. And uh, we are just trying to really push people to plant natives in their, in their landscaping and how to incorporate them on um, smaller scales in subdivisions and in the suburbs. Yes, there's a lot of land out there, right? <laughs> we also have with us uh, Barbara Berman in the virtual studio. Welcome, Barbara. Hi, how are you? Good. She's joining us from our, her kitchen, it looks like, today. She's a member of Wild Ones, Native Plants, Native Landscapes, and she's a park steward at Cherokee Park. Uh, you, you often getting heart out there pulling invasives and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, we love to do it together. We're both really into it. <laughs> awesome. There, there are ways to do this uh, even in the middle of a pandemic, right? We can socially distance and yet uh, still still do this important work, right, of restoring our landscapes. Uh, well, we've got so many great guests, I want to spend less time talking and more time listening today. So uh, why don't we uh, start with, with you, Barbara, since we just joined you into the conversation. Talk about why you're so passionate about native plants and why you think it's such an important issue for us to pay attention to amongst all the other concerns, right? Yeah, well, I had been in the environmental course for a long time, and then in the late 90s, there was a little article in the Sierra Club newsletter about native plants, and I knew nothing about them. I didn't know about the movement of planting what had originally been, you know, been here before the colonials came. So um, I took a class over at the Slato um, center in Frankfurt, outside of Frankfurt, and learned about them and got interested in Wild Ones, Native Plants, Native Landscapes is a national organization with local chapters. And we had a chapter here at the time led by Portia and Jerry Brown. And so I joined and got interested in it. And Nate, uh, I, I should have mentioned Wild Ones too, also you can find on Facebook, right? Correct. We have also a 
Facebook group, um, Wild Ones Louisville. Okay, cool. And uh, Hart, why don't you talk a little bit about that organization? I know you're deeply involved in it. Uh, how do you all work? What do you all do? Well, uh, we ha have a, a Facebook group that people can go to and ask whatever question they want about, uh, you know, here, here's my landscape and, and what should I plant here? And here's a plant. How do I identify that? So we have that type of uh, community thing going on. And uh, what else do I say about it? Barbara, what else do I say about wild ones? Let me share with you why I got passionate about this. I grew up in a family of naturalists and we could identify birds and I had a leaf collection and an insect collection and, and uh, you know, it, it's all about what you could identify and what you could hunt and, and hunting and fishing. And, and uh, my parents were, you know, Republicans who were concerned about the environment. And, um, but we never knew how ecosystems work. So uh, years later, I, I come to find out that metal arcs are down because of the lack of native plants and quails are, are down because of the lack of native, by 80 to 90 percent. And they're down because they're ground nesting birds and you see it need a certain physical structure in, in the ground, you, you certain plants like goldenrod and so-called forbs. But anyway, that's, I, I started to learn the connection between native plants and the wildlife that they support. Then that led me to uh, understand that monarchs are down by like 90, 95% because they don't have milkweed, milkweed being a host plant for monarch butterflies. And then uh, that led me to Doug Tallamy, which really gave me my uh, understanding of what host plants are. And, like the, and just within the last four years, there's a database that's available to anybody and everybody. It'll tell you county by county, type in your zip code, and that way you find out uh, what are the native plants in your locality that support the most caterpillars, which turns out to be a strong indicator. So, you know, oaks are number one in that list and plums and cherries are number two and willows are number three and birches are number four and maples are number five and on down the list. The, uh, uh, here, and the reason it's important to know these is because if you want a diversity and abundance of animals, then you, you need a diversity and abundance of insects. If you ha have a diversity and abundance of insects, you need to have a diversity and abundance of native plants. It's not about planting a red bud in your yard and say, oh, check that off the list and done with that. There really needs to be a, a, a diversity and abundance of native plants. Conversely, the invasive and non-native plants are food deserts for our, especially the leaf eating insects. Many of our pollinators don't care that much, but our leaf eating insects, which are the basis for the entire rest of the food chain, depend on a diversity and abundance of native plants such as the ones that I, that I just named. In fact, Dr. Tallamy says, if you have 5% of those top ranking plants, then, then you can feed 75% of the leaf eating insects, which is kind of an important thing. So, so that's how I got started. Very cool. And, you know, Elizabeth, we're hearing all that life in your backyard. Do you, do you attribute that to what you've got planted back there? I assume it's uh, got an abundance of diversity of native plants, right? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, me? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Alicia. Yes, um, there is quite a, a bit of diversity here for sure. Uh, we have lived here um, three years, and I think in that amount of time, the neighbors have said they've seen more insects, more flying creatures, more things than they've seen in the 30 years that they've lived here. There is all kinds of stuff to come and watch. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what are you, some of your favorite things to look at right now that maybe are blooming at this time of year? Um, yeah, oh gosh. Um, <laughs> it's hard to pick up. Early, a yeah, I know, that's a hard one. I like, <laughs> you know, um, the bee bombs that bloom early. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the wild lupine that's blooming. That's beautiful, mm. for sure. And Elizabeth, what about you? What do you have planted? Um, well, some of the really early, um, well, obviously the spring ephemerals and the uh, woodland wildflowers that are sort of ending their time, which would be like the celandine poppies and the wild geranium, bloodroot, trilliums. Um, 
while ginger, the ferns are just, you know, oh, open yeah. up. And then um, some of the spring flowers that are coming in now are um, the false blue indigo, eastern blue star, uh, golden alexander. Um, so I even saw buds on my uh, butterfly milkweed today. So. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've out, and in a client's home, I saw buds on a purple coneflower. So, I mean, it still has time to go, but, you know, there's, the weather's been, you know, with this next week of heat, these next two weeks, it's going to push things to open a lot faster. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Uh, it's really starting to pop out there. <laughs> Is it still a good time to plant, though? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we plant, you know, usually I start planting or advise people to wait until the last frost, which is typically derby weekend, but obviously this year it was a week later. <laughs> so, um, you know, don't, even though it gets warm in April, I really, I would not advise planting unless you can really protect it. And then um, I stopped planting in late June because the heat of midsummer is pretty stressful for the plants. And then I start planting again in September and plant through November. Okay, so there's a fall, a fall season, kind of like with trees. Yeah. yeah, fall is a great time to plant. I mean, really fall, you get to jumpstart everything coming up in the spring. So you have a much more mature plant coming up and, you know, a much more mature root system. Josh, you, you wanted to pipe in? Have you been getting your hands dirty? Oh, yeah, we've been very busy here uh we've expanded gardens pretty much all throughout our entire backyard leaving basically a decent strip for the dogs but <laughs> we probably removed almost half of the grass in our entire landscaping here and filled it all with native plants wow well you bring up a good point a lot of people use their yards for their pets as well so let's talk about that how compatible are these native plants with, uh, say, a ferocious dog <laughs> or an energetic one, anyway? Well, I feel like I feel like with any new plant, like a first season plant, it's going to be like any flower. You're going to kind of need to protect it and find a way to rear your dogs away from it. But we have noticed also that once you get past that first year and they're pretty established, they can take a bit more of a beating than a typical ornamental plant, say, from a box store. And there are native grasses as well that we could use in, in, instead of our lawn, correct? Yes, this is true. There's uh, different options. Um, there's a lot of grasses that grow in bigger clumps, like, uh, you know, your blue stems and things like that. And then there's lawn alternatives that uh, I am not super familiar with, but uh, there are options out there for pet-friendly grass alternatives as well. Anybody else have any experience with pets and natives they want to chime in about? I think with any yard, it's it's a it's very difficult when you have. It depends on the pet, you know. Some yeah. dogs like to dig, some yeah. <laughs> like to lay down right on top of your favorite plant. It just you know it just really depends. But I think if you are a big plant person and a pet person, you know you can find a way to design your yard to have both. And of course, we, we, we tend to just cover everything in lawn, right? And, and we don't need to do that. Sure, maybe the pet does need a lawn or the kids or whoever needs some lawn, but there's always, there's always marginal areas uh, along the fence line or along the verge, along the roadway or something like that, right? Where we could replace that uh, standard, everybody puts down the same lawn with something interesting and life-giving, right? I want to give my stump speech on lawn and other uh, more experienced people can push back on this, but it's like, lose the lawn mower. It's like, why is the city, why is the city and the state spending all of this money mowing, 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 spewing a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, carbon and other particulate pollution into the air. Uh, and and when, you, when you mow, for one thing, you're mowing down wildflowers. You're mowing down uh, tree seedlings that otherwise might be able to grow. If you, even, even if the grass is non-native and European and whatever, a taller grass is going to absorb more water when it rains so that there's less pollution going into the uh, waterways. And it, it just seems to me like we could take the, the same or less 
time, money, effort, labor, expertise, and put it into uh, you know, get, uh, gardeners that know how to manage a no-mow lawn rather than all of this heavy equipment that you know, through the life cycle of this heavy equipment, it's just terribly polluting and it's just a mindless exercise. So that's my fairly extreme view of things. I welcome a more moderate voice. Uh, I'll chime in just with, um, I think that you know, people, uh, what people gravitate towards typically is what they're used to seeing. And what we're used to seeing is you know, lawn with landscaping that just hugs the house and maybe the fence line. So in some ways, you know, part of um, is thinking outside the box, you know, thinking about where you can have more landscaping. But at the same time, the lawn, you know, some bit of lawn or some bit of uniformity is relaxing to the eye. And so to be able to, even, even if, uh, you know, you, you're a person who doesn't want to give up your lawn, you know, you could still have a small patch of lawn to give you that reprieve, but you can also do things with your lawn, like Hart was saying, like as you let it grow up, there are a lot of things that bloom in your lawn that are important for bees and for flies and other things that, um, you know, they, they benefit from it. So a lot of times what I'll do in my yard, I have a kind of a small round lawn in my backyard and I will, uh, you know, let the violets bloom. Uh, when they're done blooming, I'll mow. And then once the um, once some of the other like midsummer things start coming up, like the clover, I'll leave patches that are longer, but you know, higher up. But it looks intentional. And I think that that is one of the things about native landscaping that can make people shy away from it is they they think it looks too wild and they they don't think of it as intentional. And, um, and that's why, you know, the education around it, the passion around it, and also the design around it is important. Yeah, that's a great point. There's a, there's a big difference between just letting everything go and, uh, and being really intentional about how you plant. But that's why we need the services of folks like you, right? Because we don't, we don't learn these skills in school, right? Like nobody's out there even doing cooperative extension about native plants, right? It's really hard to find help. I do think it's hard to find help, but you know, organizations like Wild Ones and uh, some of the different nurseries, I mean, there, there's a growing number of people that, um, you know, are, are passionate about native plants. And I mean, my hope is just that one day you walk into a big box store or you walk into one of our larger nurseries and you see lots of options for native plants because right now it's a specialty and it's a niche. Mm. Do you, do you find, we, can, let, let's what? talk a little bit about like big picture global, why this is important. Can you say insect Armageddon? It's like there's study after study coming out of how many insects we've lost as, uh, uh, in, the, in recent years. And you know, a world without insects is a world without people. Uh, we, we can't have this inherently violent attitude toward other living things and ourselves survive. There was a study done in Germany over the course of something like 35, 40 years that indicated that the number of insects in natural areas has declined by 75%. Doesn't mean the number of species have, doesn't mean 75% of species have gone extinct, but the, like the number or the, actually the weight, the total weight the total mass of insects has gone down by 75%. This shows that what we do in our homes and industrial areas impacts the natural areas. And it shows that the natural areas themselves are not enough space. You know, a butterfly or a bee or a bird doesn't know when it's at the edge of Bernheim Forest. They just need to go and they need to have uh, corridors along the way, but yet, you know, so I, one thing I, I tell people is that living things need, what do living things need? Food, water, shelter, et cetera. The thing that is the least understood is the food that they need. And native plants provide that food. Just, just say it. And they need a freedom from poisons and a freedom from things that kill them, a freedom from insecticides. But most people understand that. They don't understand what foods 
the, uh, the what foods are needed, and that's where native not only native plants but also native trees, you know, um, oaks and hickories and beeches and your your native trees. You're listening to us here on Forward Radio. This is Truth to Power with me, Justin Mogg, and Hart Hagen. Uh, we're, we're co-hosts here and programmers at Forward Radio, along with some great community experts on the topic of native plants and what they do for all of us. Elizabeth Kuhn is in the virtual studio. She is owner of Backyard Botanicals. You can find them at backyardbotanicalsky.com. We also have Alicia and Josh Fuel. They are from Grow Wilder Native Plant Nursery, uh, and you can find them on Facebook at Grow Wilder KY. And Barbara Berman is here, member of Wild Ones Native Plants, Native Landscapes, and a park steward for Cherokee Park. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a big uh, food gardener, so I'm thinking about planting food for me right now. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work focused on me, right? But it's important that we also plant to feed others that, that we share this planet with. And whether that's thinking about planting extra food for your neighbors or extra food for your non-human neighbors, right? Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how this is so important and and impactful. Uh, anybody want to chime in? Uh, well, I, I was going to say that, um, you know, just to kind of back up a little bit, you know, for listeners that might be saying, okay, native plants, like, how do I know what is a native plant? And um, I get that all the time. And when I familiar with uh, native plants, they oftentimes just say, I mean, I've even had people ask me if native plants had something to do with Native Americans. And I mean, I guess loosely, you can say that, <laughs> you know, they, they were thinking that it was like used by Native Americans. And they, they really just were thinking a plant is a plant. I, they had no, you know, they didn't know there was any distinction. So, um, so I think, you know, Native plants have even that th those are the plants that some have naturalized, but that have been here for a, a significant amount of time and have evolved with the things that are pollinating them, using them as food, and you know helping them to reproduce. So you know you have uh, there are great examples of where you have well the, the monarchs are a huge example that people are very familiar with. But other examples are bees, some of our lo local bees that are not honeybees, and they, they are anatomically made to only get nectar from one plant. If that plant is not here, that bee is not here. And if that bee is not here, it interrupts the entire chain. So th those sorts of things are like, you know, maybe that's like a microscopic way of looking at it, but the whole idea of having a native garden is creating habitat. It's not necessarily creating just landscape, but it's creating habitat and it is improving the ecology of your backyard and then your neighborhood and then your community, you know? So, so it's, it's just, it is a very holistic way to look at gardening and landscaping. I have a question for Elizabeth and Alicia and Josh. Uh, so we, there are different like, categories. People might be wanting to know what plants can we get. So you think in terms of what are the sun-loving wildflowers, you might call that a meadow, or some of the shade-loving wildflowers, you might call that a woodland. And then what are some of the water-loving or the wet soil-loving wildflowers, and you might call that a rain garden or a wetland. So in those different categories, like what are some of the popular plants in each category? Everyone definitely loves milkweed. That's, you know, the first go-to, at least that's what I've found. They want to support the monarchs, you know, and then you to educate them on more things. Um, I just work with what I have here. We don't really have a rain garden area per se, so I, and I don't have a lot of shade, so I'm not really familiar with the, the woodland plants as far as growing them myself. Um, I know of some of them, but a lot of thought. <laughs> well, you, you have a, a, a range of sun-loving wildflowers that you sell. What are some of those that people might like to have? Um, coneflowers, wild bergamot, mountain mints are one of my favorites. They're great pollinators. I, 
I can't speak enough good things about mountain mint. Mm. Um, people are always shy away from it because it's mint and they think it's going to take over an area. But the amount of pollinators that I see on it is, is pretty fantastic. Um, Elizabeth, what are some of your goats? Well, I think, um, you know, to talk about like, uh, there, there are, you know, like part you're saying sun loving and shade loving, um, Alicia mentioned some really great ones. Uh, like for instance, you know, she, before we started, we were talking about all the bird sounds and she was talking about the gold finches that she's seen, you know, in her yard recently. And, you know, typically I see an influx of the gold finches in my yard in the fall when the all the echinaceas, all the cone flowers, especially the purple cone flower, is uh, seeding. Now, if you have a cone flower that is not a native cone flower, oftentimes, you know, it's not gonna provide the same nutrition or access to those seeds. So th those, are, those are things I'm kind of differentiating between the native versus a non-native or, or even an exotic. You know, um, so I would say, and then in terms of rain gardens, um, I have a fair amount of experience in rain gardens. Um, and uh, rain gardens, they, they take plants that are, uh, are semi-wetland plants. So they can take the inundation of water when we have heavy rains and the rain garden fills with water. But then, you know, in Ju July and August, when we have drought times, they can also withstand those hot, dry times. Um, so you know, some of the ones, even some of the ones that Alicia mentioned, like the, um, the bee balm and um, the, uh, any kind of aster, goldenrods, the lobelias, um, those are all good rain garden. The swamp milkweed is a good rain garden plant. Um, and then also there's a lot, a lot of people talk to me about erosion. You know, they have a hillside that has are great for that because their root system is so profound that it just um, you know it will it can anchor the soil like turf grass would never be able to do because of the difference in the root structure. Which species is that that is great? There's a lot of different native grasses and sedges so oh, okay. you, know, you could do prairie if it depends if you have sun or shade you know for sun right. you could do prairie drop seed you could do fox sedge frank sedge frank sedge prefers more moisture uh, you could do river roads and then when you get into the shade there's also a lot of shade loving sedges that um, that would be great on a hillside well, let's talk a little bit more about rain gardens because I don't know how commonly understood they are. Why, why you'd want to put one in if you can only put one in in an area that's already wet. Uh, I don't know, Barbara, have you put in a rain garden? Do you have any experience with that? I haven't put in one. I've seen um, one put in in the highlands. Um, so they, you know, an area that would sort of flood, maybe your um, downspout goes to that area or your your properties slope to that area, you would um, kind of create more of a retaining area. So it doesn't just run off and then you could plant those certain plants that are good for it that can tolerate the wet dry conditions. So it's, it's great, you know, in, in certain, you know, if you have that situation, it's a great idea. And of course, in, in the center part of our city, <clears throat> keeping runoff from going into the sewer system is really important because we have a combined sewer system that tends to overflow anytime we get a good amount of rain, and then we're sending our raw sewage out to our neighbors downriver. Uh, so anything you can do as a, as a landowner to reduce the amount of runoff from your land, uh, whether it's depaving or uh, disconnecting your downspouts from the sewer system, a lot of them are just directly connected in, uh, putting in a rain garden to retain some of that water, uh, all of that can really benefit, uh, have a much larger ecological benefit than just in your yard, right? Um, anybody want to talk more about rain gardens and what you've, how a good application you've seen? Um, you know, the MSD has um, a lot of material online about how to's for rain gardens that were created by Phyllis Croce and some others. And um, th those are good resources. Actually, there's a lot of really good step-by-step -step resources online, but 
you know, you do need to do a fair, a, some construction, not a ton of additives to it, but you do need to till the area. And as Barbara was talking about, um, you know, you're creating a berm, you're creating a shallow bowl that can help to hold that water. And you're also creating a burn, like a small hill around it that will that will keep um, that will keep the the water within that area. And then you are bringing your downspout um, in from your house into that area, you know, with a corrugated pipe. And uh, you do need to think about how big your rain garden is compared to how much square footage is your roof. And you need to also um, you know, make sure that you have it at a distance from your house that you're not, you know, uh, potentially uh, risking things with your foundation. So, um, and then from there, you know, one of the things I'd like to mention too about native plants, you know, people will always say to me, um, well, people always want low maintenance. <laughs> now, that that is a, that, that term doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> in my field, I don't think, but you can, um, but some of the things about native plants, they are accustomed to our soil, our rainfall, and our temperatures. And so you're, you don't need to amend the soil as you're planting, you know, you don't need to, because sometimes if you're dumping compost into the hole you're digging for that tree or that plant, you're creating this really nice, very small environment that the plant will just go round and round and it really won't push the plant to, for its roots to, to go out into the soil. So I, I don't, um, you know, for a rain garden, you might need to add some sand if it's super compact, but I'm usually not adding any kind of fertilizer or, uh, you know, any kind of compost. Now, after you've planted, you can always do a natural compost like mulch leaves or grass clippings and you know, obviously hardwood mulch is something that is um, good for weed suppression and for maintenance purposes. But, um, and then also once you plant that plant, you know, you water it for the every five days or so, unless we get an inch of rain. But then after the first growing season, you don't water it. You don't need to water it. It is okay. And you will see if you have non-natives and natives in your backyard, you will see the difference between uh, how they look in July, how they look in October is going to be a really good indication to you of what what it naturally has evolved here and what has not. This is a very good point and that's what I like to tell people when they buy native plants is that yes the first year you will have to keep an eye on them and treat them a little you know a little baby them a little bit more but after that it's amazing to see how they don't have to be coddled you know everyone's so used to you know I need to add fertilizer and I need to water it and tend to it and it's like no you just let it do its thing it will be right it, it's going to be great you know just let it go and then I think also it's so, good to mention that after you have that first year and once it starts to self seed and once it starts to spread as you let it you know do that and sort of in a sense turn from like growing a garden to curating a garden that's when your yard becomes low maintenance. Right. Because those plants are number one, taking care of themselves and you don't have a lot of bare soil and bare mulch where weed seeds will come in. So that's, that's really how you create a natural uh, low maintenance yard. And it comes with time, you know, time and, and right plant, right place and, and curating it. So I, you can kind of think of it then like an investment in, it might not be low maintenance off the start, but right. you're investing in a future low maintenance lawn. Yeah. And they always say, I mean, with, especially if you do a seeding of a prairie or a meadow, it's always the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps and the third year it leaps. And that, <laughs> that's true for, you know, all of the gardens that I put in, you know, you know, you just, you see such a difference the third year it really is blooming into its maturity. I have a question. Uh, have you uh, had any success stories about uh, neighbors that are using pesticides and then persuading them to not use pesticides or is that unrealistic or is that even an issue in your world? 
my neighbors are, are pretty chill. They, they don't spray. I know she does fertilize her yard like maybe once a season. Um, they are really courteous to our area. <laughs> and so I think that that seeing what we do kind of changes their outlook a little bit for sure. Mm -hmm. I know Blair Leano Helvey decided to locate her, if she has Idlewild Butterfly Farm, she decided to locate in, what's, is that Smoketown or she, but where? Shelby where, Park. Shelby it, Park. Where uh, she decided to locate there because there's not as much pesticides in that neighborhood as there would be in a more upscale neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's pretty sad. <laughs> And I'm sure it is an important part of good communication with your neighbors, explaining what you're doing, right? Because otherwise, as was mentioned earlier, it might just look like a overgrown weed patch. But uh, if you can make it Absolutely. clear what's going on uh, and explain what you're planting, that will make all the difference in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I've had to do a lot of explaining um, between the, the wild plants and then, the, you know, the beehive and the hawk. There's a lot that goes on here that <laughs> the neighbors are like, what is she up to now? <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about woodlands because, you know, when you hear about native plants and wildflowers, the first thing that comes to people's mind is the sun-loving meadow, which is not, there's some of that in Kentucky. Obviously there's some of that, but Kentucky wants to be a forest. So what do we do about those parts of Kentucky that want to be a forest? One thing is, uh, you know, is to deal with invasive species. And so, you know, some of the most significant invasive species include bush honeysuckle and winter creeper. Barbara and I are dealing with an area of Cherokee Park called Wildflower Woods, where thankfully they've dealt with the bush honeysuckle. Uh, and now we, we, there's still some bush honeysuckle there that we have to go through and pull. And there's still some Japanese honeysuckle, but mainly we're doing battle with the winter creeper which is still being sold in stores, mm. uh, but it's, uh, but you know, the, the invasive species are a problem because they outcompete our native plants, including tree seedlings. If you have enough invasive species, then your tree seedlings are not going to grow. So you need to get rid of the invasives for that reason. And also because invasive non-native plants are, are, a, uh, are a food desert. But, but once you deal with the invasive plants, then what we're seeing in wildflower woods after decades of, of TLC from wild ones and also the park stewards is that you have uh, native wildflowers coming in. Uh, Barbara, help me jog my memory. What are some of the, we have Dutchman's breeches, we have Jack in the pulpit, we have squirrel corn, we have may apples, we have Solomon seal, all these things that I assume that they planted some of them, but many of them just come in naturally if you can deal with the invasive species first and give the native plants room to grow. And if we don't do that, it's a death knell for our forests. I hate to sound so bleak, but wherever you see bush honeysuckle, if, if it has mm -hmm. taken over and there are no tree seedlings growing, then that forest is only going to last so long as a native forest. Especially since the bush honeysuckle actually has um, a chemical in it um, that prevents things from growing around it. So you'll, also, you'll hardly yeah. ever see anything under a bush right. honeysuckle. Also, it casts heavy shade. And, you know, underneath bush honeysuckle, if it's uh, unmitigated, unabated, it's just going to be mud because nothing can grow underneath it. And then you see this along creek banks, and it's, and it's just, it, it needs to be dealt with. I would, frankly, I would like to see some of the people that are so dedicated to planting trees also, especially when public resources are being used, I'd like to see some of those public resources being dedicated <laughs> to controlling invasive species so that you have walnut trees and maple trees and sycamore trees and oak trees growing of their own accord. Without having to be. I think a lot of that has to do with the lack of education behind it. When you see that, most people don't see an invasive, you know, bush honeysuckle taking over a forest. They just see a nice tree line. So I think that a lot, even with, you know, the, the public works and tree departments and people that seem like they should know more about it, 
just really aren't educated in the fact of, of what's invasive and what's not and what needs to be done to, to fix that issue all around. I feel like the education is really the key of, of getting people into native plants. It's just, it, there's not enough of it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Even like at our own extension office, by where, where we are, there is an entire wood line that's completely filled with nothing but kutsu taking over the entire oh. area. <laughs> and at that point, almost the only thing to even do would be to clear cut all of it and let the seed bank come back up from what's naturally underneath. Wow. It's just, yeah, it's a huge issue. And it's just something that people don't even know what it is. They just think it's this beautiful vine growing up these trees. They don't realize it's suffocating. So mm. wow. it's just all on education. Well, and I'll also mention just when, when you're like, if you're a backyard gardener and you want to clear the honeysuckle out of your backyard or the tr trumpet or the winter creeper or, you know, um, I mean, English ivy, Rose of Sharon, Nandina, burning bush, all of those are invasive. But um, so if you, if you want to um, educate yourself on clearing it so that you don't do it in vain, so that it doesn't come back. Like for instance, with honeysuckle, it is, um, you really need to, if it's, you know, already very many, not very effective to dig it out. It is better to cut it at the stump and treat it with a high percentage of um, herbicide. And that, that, that treatment will, um, can effectively kill the shrub. But if you don't, if you just cut it and you don't treat it, oftentimes it'll just come right back. So, you know, you, you definitely, um, if you're going to invest the time uh, make sure that you, you know exactly what you're going to do so that you only have to invest it that one time. Yeah. <laughs> We're having a community conversation about native plants here on Truth to Power on Forward Radio, your community radio station at 106.5 FM and forwardradio.org. My name is Justin Mogg. I'm co-hosting with Hart Hagen, uh, and we are speaking with some great community experts on this topic. You just heard from Elizabeth Kuhn, owner of Backyard Botanicals, and you can find them at backyardbotanicalsky.com. We also have Alicia and Josh Fuel from Grow Wilder Native Plant Nursery. They're on Facebook at Grow Wilder KY, and Barbara Berman's here. She's a member of Wild Ones Native Plants, Native Landscapes, and a park steward for Cherokee Park. Let's talk a little bit about where people can get these native plants. Hopefully they're convinced by now that they should plant something in their yard that's native. Um, I, you all have some nurseries, right? You might be able to supply. Uh, how many native plant nurseries are there? And can you find native plants in conventional stores? What should people look for? So um, I'll let um, Alicia and Joshua talk about their own nursery, but um, some of the other nurseries, you know, we, we don't have a plethora of nurseries in Kentucky, but we do have Drop Seed Native Plant Nursery in Goshen, Kentucky. There's uh, Iron Weed Nursery. Uh, I'm not sure which town. I think it's more central Kentucky. Um, there are some nurseries in Lexington that sell native plants. They're not exclusively native plant nurseries. Um, and then there's also mail order for retail. Um, but I, uh, I would definitely say, first and foremost, try and source your plants from a local native plant nursery. You know, either a nursery like uh, Grow Wilder or Drop Seed Nursery. Um, and then one thing that you need to be careful of when you go into um, when you go into nursery, some of the nurseries, well, any nursery, oftentimes you will see <coughs> something that says it's a native plant or in the native plant section potentially of a nursery, but oftentimes you actually have a cultivar of a native plant. So the difference is that you have a native plant, a true native plant. Um, is what you would find, you know, in the wild. It's a true native plant. It's been sourced from seed that was, you know, usually collected in the wild, grown up through seed banks. And, um, but a cultivar is a plant that, you know, as, as the plants are growing uh, and they see a native plant that has a variation that they like, like for instance, the color of purple 
or that the stems are straighter in the grass, then they selectively start harvesting seeds and they create a cultivar uh, over time that is not necessarily a true native. And there, there is a lot of research out there kind of is, is the cultivar, um, is, the, is the native plant more valuable to our wildlife? Or, and, and does it make a difference? And, and I think for myself, I do believe it makes a difference. I, um, you know, I always choose the true native and um, I think it's, you know, but so, so when, you're, when you're in a big, uh, not necessarily just a big box store, but when you're in a nursery looking at uh, native plants, just, you know, if you see swamp milkweed and then quotations after with a name, or uh, something of that, then you know that it has either been a, is a cultivar or it has been hybridized. Are you saying we should really avoid cultivars or they're just not as good? <laughs> Both. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I don't, I would not like to say, um, you know, to anyone, like, don't do that. But I think for myself and my own designs and the way that I operate my business, I, a true, I choose true natives. Um, yeah. I do think it's the best choice. If you had to have a second choice, yes, maybe you're choosing a cultivar. If I was working with a commercial business and they had really strict guidelines of how they wanted things to look, perhaps I would choose a cultivar. But most often, um, you know, the, na the true native is the way to go. Because for one thing, the, the cultivar, I mean, a true native is going to have a more diverse bank of genes within it. So it's going to be more resilient to the vicissitudes of weather and so forth. And also a cultivar, <clears throat> it, it, when they selectively breed it, they're going to breed out some of the characteristics that make it so suitable to like insect visitors and so forth. Yeah. So cultivar and that also goes to be to the educational factor of the, yeah. of the quotations. Mean, People don't know that the quotations mean that uh, that's been, you know, toyed with. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not an actual, you know, purple cone flower. I was looking through a native plant catalog. It was one of these the out of town things, which is fine, I guess. But uh, every, it was a native plant catalog, but every single one was a cultivar. Every single one had this like, the, the, we're, the quotations we're talking about are, you have a scientific name as the genus and the species. So mm -hmm. if you see it, the G, it's two scientific names in italics, and then a quotations after that, that's a cultivar. And I was looking through a catalog and every single, uh, every single offering from this native plant catalog was a cultivar. And I think, you know, not to be too out there, but I think that this, um, this also goes along with like what Alicia was saying about education and the mindset. You know, when you um, watching how things grow in nature and being able to, and people appreciate nature in nature, but they don't think about putting that same nature in their backyard. And it, and it is possible, you know, and to allow species to be, to do what they do and to not have to, um, always be, um, you know, sort of manipulating and contriving. So oftentimes, you know, people are wanting cultivars because, oh, I like this pink better than this pink. And, and it's, and at the, in the bigger scheme, that bigger ecological scheme of things, um, it is, uh, it is more about letting nature, uh, letting it be, letting it do its thing. And uh, you put in the plants and And the beauty for yourself but it is it is an alteration a little bit of a mindset and I think you do that through education yeah and to build on the education part that's where a lot of people look at those cultivars and they see those pretty colors and they see those long bloom times and yes they may be a good nectar source for some you know depending on the species but what a lot of people don't know is even though that cultivar is a nectar source it's not a food source for the young so it goes back to the saying of why feed the adults and starve the children mm. that's basically what it comes down to so let, let's talk about that if we have time uh, so you talk about feeding the adults and starving the children an example of that would be butterfly bush which will attract butterflies 
adult butterflies, but it's not a host plant for any of our no. of, of the caterpillars. So if we, we need that the host plant is that which feeds the caterpillar uh, so that the caterpillar can then grow up into a butterfly. So, you know, you want to be a lender of butterflies, not just a borrower of butterflies. You want to provide habitat so that the, they can grow from caterpillar instead of just uh, attracting butterflies that have somehow managed to go through their life cycle somewhere else. So that's why you need the host plants. And that's what this uh, top 100 plant, the Dr. Talamy and the, the top mm. 100 plants and the host plant thing is, is all about is having food for the larva. Sometimes host is short for larval host, but the caterpillar is the larvae. So you need food for the caterpillar so that it can grow up into a butterfly or moth. I asked too about, um, we don't necessarily have to buy these plants, right? Like some, some native plants can be e easily divided, maybe from your neighbors. Um, I'm sure we also want to caution people not to go into the woods and take everything out of there and put it in your yard, right? Like we have to be a little sensitive to it. But anyone want to talk about that process? If you have experience of dividing plants or gathering seeds? I can talk a little bit about, um, we have some plant rescues sometimes where we'll go to an area that's going to be disturbed because of construction oh, yeah. and dig up the plants. And we've planted since um, they're true natives that we transplant into Cherokee Park. So um, someone that lives on Floyd's Fork has um, MSD coming in and they have by eminent domain take, going to take a big swath through his farm and um, so we got to go and dig up plants and then take them to Cherokee Park. So plant rescues are a great way to deal with um, areas that are going to be disturbed anyway. We also went down to um, UofL where Margaret, Dr. Margaret Carrero um, installed a native plant garden and, got, and she wanted it looking a little neater. And so we got to dig up some plants and take those home. That's awesome. Yeah. I um, I would definitely like uh, I would definitely uh, say avoid um, harvest while harvesting. Um, I think that we have enough availability locally that that's not uh, necessary. I think dividing and also I mean because a lot of these plants are self seeding all the time. You know you can always dig up the seedlings in the spring and share. Um, dividing, you know, there are some plants that you learn over time are easier to divide than others. There are some plants that are easier to transplant, like milkweed is not an easy plant to transplant because of its taproot. Um, so uh, I think, um, but you know, you always want to, and, and also like, I'm sure Hart and Barbara can talk about this, you know, wild ones, oftentimes I'll see people talking about having extra plants that they want to find a home for. And um, they know the source and they're familiar. And, you know, so places like that just, um, but what I would be wary of, and I see this sometimes in clients' backyards, is a friend that give, is very well-meaning and gives you a plant that behaves really well in their yard and it's really pretty. And all of a sudden it's the worst invasive plant <laughs> you know, that we've seen in 25 years. So, you know, just, just do your, do your homework and make sure you know what you're putting in your backyard. Yeah. And, we and actually had created a group on Facebook, um, Grow Wilder Plant Sales and Swaps to give people a place to, you know, share natives and share seeds and kind of, a, of like a community more so of just sharing native plants with each other more so than just, hey, you have to come and buy them from us, but hey, here's some that we have a lot of, and here's, you know, if you're interested, and it's, it's been very successful, so that's, that's nice. Very cool. What about resources for, to help people identify plants? Does, do, do any of you have experience with iNaturalist or anything like that? Yeah, I have a little bit of experience. I think that's, that is good. Um, I think that's really good. It's a great resource. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, websites that will help you identify, um, 
But, and also just going back to, I mean, Dr. Mary Wharton was, you know, she wrote several books on plant identification with ferns and wildflowers of Kentucky and trees. So those, even though uh, they're books that were, you know, written many years ago, they're still relevant and they're still very helpful with their photographs and their uh, description. Very cool. Uh, did anybody mention like Facebook group plant identification is one? So I use that a lot. That is, take, yeah. a, take a picture and uh, uh, take a picture like of the leaf and the stem and upload it. And, uh, and uh, you, you have good luck. I've had good luck with that. You 95% of that. Yeah, I've had good luck with that also. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this day and age, it's hard to say you can't figure it out like <laughs> google <laughs> is a great yeah. source just you know snap a picture google lens you know i natural there are ways for people to identify things it's the knowledge is there and the education is there we just have to keep pushing it and then if you once you have the identification if you want to know if something is native then you google it that you know there's an abundance of good plant information on the internet so you if especially if you have the scientific name then you google the scientific name and then you can find the range and if kentucky or wherever you live is included in the range then you know you're dealing with the native yeah i, th I think that a lot of people are scared to dip their toes in it because it is so foreign to them. And I have to tell a lot of people just to not overthink it. Just mm -hmm. treat it like you would treat any other plant and just start a little garden, let it do its thing. Don't, you know, stress over it. And you'll see that your whole ecosystem in your yard changes. Like it, it's baffling actually how <laughs> amazing it is to watch your plant grow, grow up and what they bring in and what they can do if you just, allow them to do so. Well, we're, we're nearing the end of our time together. This has been a really great conversation, but I did want to just quickly ask if there's any other resources or things coming up or groups that people want to give a shout out to before we let everyone go. Well, I think um, other than contacting us, there anyone else uh, locally, uh, you can always Google your native plant society. Uh, just your state native plant society and they're usually pretty good about having a list of local native nurseries and those are resources and tools you can use to ask questions and gain knowledge in Louisville we have 800 members on wild ones native wow. plants group and if we don't uh, know something we know somebody who does <laughs> Drop Seed Nursery has um, on their website, they have a lot of information about native plants. That would be a good resource. Missouri Botanical Gardens is a good online resource. So, you know, it's approximately the same latitude as ours and they have a rich database of plant information and so forth. All right, these are excellent ideas. I think our audience must be really excited to get out and identify natives, plant natives, facilitate pollinators, uh, and a rich ecological diversity because we're going to need it going forward, right? <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for your time. Uh, we've been speaking with Elizabeth Kuhn, owner of Backyard Botanicals. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. I hope you have a great rest of your spring. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You can find her at backyardbotanicalsky.com. Alicia and Josh Fuel from Grow Wilder Native Plant Nursery. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day out there with all them critters we hear in the background. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thanks. It's been great. Thanks. Awesome. And Barbara Berman, I can't wait to see you out in Cherokee Park as our park steward. And she's from Wild Ones Native Plants, Native Landscapes. Thanks, Barbara. You're welcome. End the insect apocalypse. Plant habitat for birds, butterflies, and bees. Thanks, Hart. Uh, that was Hart Hagen. I'm Justin Mogg. Thank you all for tuning in. And we will be back in your ears again in one week's time here on Truth to Power. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much, y'all. This is great. <laughs>